Howdy everybody. I hope you're having a happy Thanksgiving. This will be my last lecture and I'm going to tell you everything I know about bad history. So, does bad history equal a bad movie? Well, not necessarily. As historians, you should know the difference, but you can still enjoy bad historical movies. The question is, what's the intent? Are they just being lazy and they think no one will notice? Is it funny? Is it a satire? Is it, does it have a political or social agenda? Uh, what's the point of view? Or, you know, are they just incompetent writers? Types of bad history. Now, we've already talked about uh, flubs. The flubs are just small errors in filmmaking, and they're really not relevant here. This is when, you know, the the boom mic gets in the, the shot, or, you know, it's a period historical thing, and you, you can see an airplane in the background. Inaccurate is when something is fund fundamentally misrepresented in the history or facts. And you have to ask yourself, how significant is it? Is it the time of day of the battle or who won the battle? Americans did not capture the Enigma machine and the Brits were not happy about this movie that m took a very important element of World War II and took credit for something that they had done. The other kind of inaccurate is something that is just simply made up and fictional and it's believed as real. Now, you know, nothing in the Da Vinci Code is true, but even Dan Brown was amazed that people thought it was true. And there have been many books and videos made devoted to debunking uh, the storyline of the Da Vinci Code because people believed that it was true. So, you know, that's an accurate history, but really they, you know, Dan Brown was not putting it forth as accurate history. It's just people took it that way. We've also talked about anachronistic, and this is period details. And this is problematic when people think they're getting correct history. You see this mostly in costume, technology, and culture. And this is the sort, sort of thing that matters to some people and not others. Uh, this is a very fine adaptation of Pride and Prejudice, but for someone like me, it's very bothersome that the clothing styles are completely anach anachronistic. Other people find it very bothersome if the technology or the firearms are not accurate. But this has a very uh, varying degrees of a sliding scale of this is bothersome or not. The other thing, uh, the other kind of anachronism is ideas, uh, culture, language, social issues. Ad attitudes and culture can be anachronistic as well. This is a World War II film, but it was made in the 1970s, so this spaced out hippie character is funny, but it's not accurate. It representing not only vocabulary, but attitude and worldview. Is it a problem? Well, it's a heist movie, so it's not really purporting to be historical, but I find it bothersome because it takes me out of the story you know, every time Oddball is on screen and I'm reminded that this is, you know, not accurate and shouldn't be in there. In comic history, you're not supposed to believe it either. This is things that are very clearly supposed to be uh, silly or funny. Uh, the Onion is a satire magazine. I don't know if you read it, but... <laughs> When this came out, this was, oh, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago, but when The Onion put this in, you know, their newspaper, uh, China apparently didn't know that The Onion is a satirical magazine, and it was big news and reported on state television in China that the United States was actually going to move the capital and was going to have a retractable dome. So... If you if you don't if you're not tuned in to what's uh, comical you know what's satire you can definitely get sucked in. Uh, many of you may be familiar with the Babylon Bee, and the first couple times I saw things you know posted from the Babylon Bee, I was thrown off. But once I was in on the joke, you know I I enjoyed a lot. Other examples. 
uh, Saturday Night Live. Nobody should be getting their news from Saturday Night Live. Spinal Tap is not a real band, or it wasn't started as a real band. Of course, it is now. Um, Teenage Dog Walkers did not break the Watergate case, but no one's expected to believe this, so, you know, it's okay. The next thing we're going to look at is alternate history. Uh, this is what if things had turned out differently? What if, uh, you know, history had changed, different people won the war, or, you know, someone wasn't assassinated, you know, if somebody else had won the election? This is very popular in novels because you can really explore uh, alternate histories. You know, what if the South had won the Civil War? What if the Nazis had won World War II? Those are both two subjects that are very popular for alternate history. Again, you're not supposed to view this as actual history, but it can be very interesting if they use good facts as a starting point. If they're getting their real history wrong before they launch into the alternate history, then the fascination with the alternate history is not going to work very well. Time travel is a favorite, and that can involve actual historic events. And, of course, this is causes debates in both science and history. The thing that makes time travel stories interesting to historians is the butterfly effect, the fact that small changes in one person's story can have a chain reaction and a huge impact on others' seemingly unrelated events. It makes you think about how all of history is interwoven. So, you know, the hot tub time machine, you know, it, it doesn't really have historical events, but it does go back to, you know, the 80s. And so, you know, accurately representing what the 80s were like or back to the future, looking back at what the 50s were like. And of course, Time Bandits is very fantastical. Another twist in time travel is the parallel universe, and those of you who are friends of Star Trek are familiar with this. When they rebooted the Star Trek um, cycle, they used the same characters from the original television sister series, but they put them on an alternate track, a sort of parallel universes that both of these things existed. Okay, that's all the easy stuff. Now let's talk about the hard stuff revisionist history. This is the thing that the historians really need to consider when they are reading and watching. This is rewriting history through interpretation. And this is an important job of historians, but it's also the mission of many people who have an agenda to rewrite history to reflect their politics, identity, or beliefs. In the good area, reanalyzing historical evidence for greater understanding can be very valuable. You know, looking back in hindsight with a fuller perspective, we need to revise when new facts come to light. You know, the, the Sally Hemings story uh, with Thomas Jefferson was denied for, for literally centuries. Um, you know, it was slander and gossip. But then when it was proven, now we have to include that in our uh, understanding and consideration of Thomas Jefferson. On the other hand, were the Native Americans really savages who needed to be eliminated for the sake of civilized people? Well, no. So that's a, a good change in revisionist history. On the mad side, it can also be destructive to truth and understanding when we try to lay out our current interests and priorities on top of history to twist it into something that never was. Inserting current politics, attitudes, social mores, social philosophies where they didn't exist, rewriting history to support a current political and social goal is not good history. So let's consider Christopher Columbus. Uh, was he a Christian hero or a genocidal monster? should we have a holiday celebrating this person? Now, on the one hand, and the reason we've had Columbus Day for, you know, hundreds of years, um, is that Columbus bravely discovered America. He brought new wealth to the Europeans. He civilized and Christianized savage people, and he changed the course of Western culture and gave us our land, and this is why we celebrate the holiday. On the other hand, uh, it was an accident. He wasn't trying to find North or South America. He was trying to get rich. He didn't discover anything. Uh, he just ran into people that were already here, 
and he brought with him disease, death, and oppression, which is why um, there is a growing movement to celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day instead of Columbus Day. Now, a historian has a lot of work there with unintended consequences, multiple cultures. It's not good or bad, it's just history. All of these things work together. It's not black and white, but in popular culture, it's either, you know, we get a holiday to celebrate the discovery of a, you know, the, the continents or uh, the current movement to make him the devil that should be, you know, uh, spoken of in very ill terms and, and not celebrated at all. Of course, you know, we're all familiar with the statue con controversy. This slide is actually from the last time I taught this class two years ago. Um, and this was a Nathan Bedford Forrest uh, monument. But of course, since then, especially this year, this has absolutely exploded. So you have to ask, and of course, nothing is more popular culture than the, you know, the monuments that are in our public spheres and the, the buildings that our government occupies. So should monuments and place names be permanent to reflect history, or should they change as taste and opinions change? You know, some view it as removing offensive materials and others consider it erasing history. Now, right now, it's concentrated very much on the Civil War, you know, take down those racists. But you know who else was racist and sexist? Nearly every American until the mid 20th century. You know, take President Wilson. So if you take down every statue and rename every building uh, of everyone that ever oppressed women or blacks or Native Americans or just expressed ideas that are outdated, we would have to rename most of the schools and public buildings in America. How about renaming whole cities? Um, in the one case um, on the St. Petersburg coming to becoming Leningrad and now back to St. Petersburg, it is common um, new governments giving cities new names, uh, especially totalitarian governments who want to create new societies. Um, but, you know, changing the whole name of a city is, is cumbersome and a lot of it never takes. And, you know, in this case of St. Petersburg, once the, you know, Soviet Union broke up, they went right back to calling it St. Petersburg. It's, it's really hard to make a change that colossal. On the other hand, uh, you have what you know many consider to be a very positive change. Um, Mumbai was the original name of the city in India. When the uh, colonial British came, they renamed it to Bombay, mostly because they couldn't pronounce Mumbai. So for hundreds of years, it was called Bombay. But then um, some years after independence, with the uh, country reclaiming its own identity, they went back to Mumbai. So you see this a lot in a formal, former colonial nations uh, once the colonial period is over, reclaiming a lot of names to their, you know, original identity. So, you know, that, that's a, a good uh, aspect of the revisionism. Um, names and symbols are rooted in larger power identity uh, politics. Um, whether you call the country Burma or Myanmar depends on your political stance. You know, it's, it's a real issue, you know, to, to call the country uh, Burma uh, states that you believe that the current government is, uh, you know, illegitimate and oppressive, and if you call it Myanmar, then it shows that you are kowtowing to the oppressors. The next aspect we see a lot in revisionist history is homosexuality. And this is really a reflection of popular culture. There are plenty of legitimate historical examples of homosexuals, as Alexander here. And certainly studying different cultural attitudes towards sexuality through history is very useful. You know, and it's good to revise history if you're coming from a period where the truth was suppressed because of current morality, you know, like, you know, in ancient Greece. 
You can also do it as a legitimate biographical study. Leonardo da Vinci, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that he was probably uh, a homosexual. And, you know, that was not discussed for many centuries because it was a taboo subject. So if you're doing, you know, uh, you know a study on da Vinci and his life, uh, considering that aspect is relevant. Um, but, you know, recently uh, there was a big to-do, you know, with a biographer claiming Abraham Lincoln was gay. And, you know, this comes into, you know, having, uh, you know, a particular agenda of if we name as many people in, uh, in the past as possible as being homose homosexual, that somehow legitimizes homosexuality in the present. But you know, homosexuality, one way or the other, doesn't need false representatives in the past for, you know, current political justification. So this is, uh, you know, an example that, that really muddies the water because you can't find evidence in a lot of cases that something isn't true. Um, you know, someone makes the suggestion, you know, of something historically that's not true, it's very hard to combat that and say, well, no, Lincoln wasn't gay. Uh, and and the revisionists are usually louder because they have an agenda and they're going out to promote an idea. Um, last time I taught this class, uh, when I was researching, I found a 30-minute documentary proving that Obama was gay. Now, why? Uh, I didn't actually watch it, so I don't know if it was someone who was trying to discredit Obama because he was a secret homosexual or someone who was trying to claim Obama as, you know, one of them because he's just like us, he's gay. But either way, it's completely ridiculous and somebody devoted a lot of time trying to build this, you know, story, you know, in order to convince people that it's, you know, just a completely personal agenda. And of course, race. Um, there has been a big movement, really maybe in the past 30 years, of outing people who were really black as if historians have conspired to hide the fact. Um, revisionists want to identify Cleopatra and other Egyptians as the same race and culture as Central or Southern Africans. And the continent of Africa has many diverse people groups and a very long history. And the people who want to correlate Cleopatra or other ancient Egyptians to West African or Central African ethnicity, they want to link them to a culture that they simply did not share for purposes of enhancing the prestige of black, and this is mostly black Americans, uh, culture. And actual historians recognize that African culture is rich and diverse enough to stand on its own as a field of study without borrowing some other famous person to stand in for them. And again, this is like the, the homose homosexuality of, you know, oh, homosexuality is cool because look at these other gay people is good if you're talking about actual gay people, but not if you're just naming people you want to include. And again, you know, if you want to look back at African history for, you know, riches and wealth and power and, you know, interesting history, there's plenty to pull from there. You don't have to twist the Egyptians and say that they were Central Africans. And again, this is only done by people who want to somehow change the identity to match their own identity. But on the other hand, uh, here we have a case of sort of racial revisionism being more positive. Um, culture is moving towards understanding that Jesus was not a pale, blonde, blue-eyed man. Uh, now, this is also revisionist history, but it's good because it's getting a truer picture of who Jesus actually was. Race and history is an issue that is very heated, and it's not just in academics, but in the popular realm. You know, when you're talking about um, you know, either a, um, you know, a religious identification or a racial identification or, you know, sexual identity, it's very natural to want to look back in history and identify, you know, the people that you identify, you want to make them like you. So that's why for centuries, Europeans have wanted to make Jesus look like them, not like a Middle Eastern Jew. But, 
you know, in actual historical terms, you know, he, he was not Swedish. So you can't say history is history because clearly it's not. History is commonly manipulated to serve the current culture, as is the case with feminism. Now, Jane Austen is my favorite author, and she, you know, did not write historical fiction. She actually wrote fiction, you know, several hundred years ago. So it's not history, but it is historical. And I know a lot about 18th and 19th century Europe because I read not things set in 18th and 19th century Europe, but fiction that was written at the time. And Jane Austen is not a 20th century feminist. Her novels reflect the English middle class values in 1800. Although she is very witty in observing how the system worked, she was not trying to change anything. Hollywood keep, keeps making these anachronistic adaptations in which her heroines are outspoken rebels. Now, being an important historical female does not make someone a 20th century Western feminist, but revisionist historians tend to want to take every important woman in every time period in culture and put her in the same box, you know, make her concerned with the same issues that American women are concerned with in the 20th and now in the 21st century. And again, this is taking something we identify with and wanting to change history to match our perception of ourselves. Of course, we've talked about the national culture, uh, natural character quite a bit. Um, we've already talked about this, that, you know, they, the Native Americans used to be portrayed as a monolithic group, you know, all savages, all sharing the same religion, you know, the same culture. And, you know, it, it's moved, you know, to understanding that, you know, these are very different cultures, different people groups with different ways of living, different governments and war and religions. But you have the, you know, the bad where you keep going so far as to say all Native Americans were blissed out, peace-loving nature freaks, uh, when the truth is they were happy to have access to new technology, but they were not happy to be robbed and murdered. So this is common in every country with a colonial history. It's easier to justify moving in and taking over if the natives are lesser people, savage, simple, or less than human. Then, uh, after colonialism, there's a swing in the other direction to make the original habit inhabitants mythic, noble, superior. Now, you may be familiar with this. This comes around, I don't know, like every five years, the Texas textbooks. This is a serious problem. The Texas textbook battle uh, is basically, the state of Texas buys so many textbooks that they control the content of educational materials sold around the whole nation because the textbooks publishers, you know, don't want to make different versions of things for different parts of the country. And so the Texas really gets to sort of drive what's included. But the Texas textbook committee is comprised of political appointees, not educators. They're not historians. They're not scientists. So there's always controversy because they want to make the material reflect a white conservative Christian worldview and leave out anything that goes against their worldview. Of course, there are also groups that want to rewrite textbooks to make all important people into black gay feminists. So, you know, revising history, you know, when it comes to, you know, of course, we've, we've talked about this, you know, some that you know, depending on the age level, you need to simplify, you need to choose your, you know, facts. You probably don't want, you know, the whole ugly truth of, you know, eradicating the Native Americans in a second grade uh, uh, curriculum. But this is the sort of thing that needs to be done by scientists and historians and educators and not by people with a particular um, agenda or a particular uh, political uh, point of view that they're trying to push. Now, of course, deniers are the worst kind of revisionists. Now, so here's some examples of things that never actually happened. Uh, we never had a Holocaust. Uh, Tokyo, uh, the Japanese were not aggressors in the uh, Second World War. Uh, the Armenians uh, were not 
uh, also eradicated, and uh, the United States and Russia never had a Cold War. Now, many of you went to see Irene Zizblatt next week, uh, last week, and she has been harassed by people who say she made the whole thing up. Now, if you were there, that was an incredibly moving story. And can you imagine that woman going through what she's gone through and having people stalking her and emailing her and harassing her saying that all of that is a lie? There are literally tens of thousands of people all around the world who are being taught that the Holocaust never happened. Uh, as for the Armenian genocide, it's actually illegal in Turkey to mention it. There is an official denial in Turkey that they wiped out a whole population of their own citizens. And, you know, this causes diplomatic strife all the time because, of course, the, the remaining Armenians, you know, are fighting for recognition. And if, if a nation acknowledges that the Armenians were victims of genocide, then Turkey doesn't want to have diplomatic relations with them. I know this is ridiculous, but it's going on. There's also a big move uh, as time goes on to sort of make everyone equal in the Pacific, uh, World War II, uh, that somehow Americans and Japanese were just fighting over territory and overlooking the fact that the Japanese had been systematically taking over large chunks of Asia and um, enslaving native populations um, in all sorts of horrible ways, horrible atrocities. Um, but, you know, as time goes on and, and we have, you know, much better relationship with the Japanese and the Japanese, you know, very, you know, successful nation, there's a move to sweep a lot of that under the rug and rewrite the history, which is not to say that, you know, we should be, you know, carrying a grudge, but we, you know, you can't go back and say, oh, the causes of the war and the actions of the war were uh, any different than they were. A few years ago, we had some students who questioned that the Cold War was being exaggerated. And you can see that in the current Russia stories. Attitudes about Russia being the single biggest threat to the well-being of the U.S. has changed radically in my lifetime. You know, when I was in grade school, um, the Soviet Union was the number one enemy, and we had huge diplomatic problems and a very... Uh, real concern of nuclear war, and certainly, um, you know, during the 1950s, uh, you know, the communist scare in the government, there has been incredible impact on our society of the relationship between these two nations. And now we have a situation that, you know, many people just don't think working with the Russians or hiring them to provide security for our embassies is any big deal. Um, and not to say that we need to, you know, maintain this Cold War mentality, but you have to consider what has gone before when you consider what is. And sometimes it's convenient um, for current politics to uh, look past history, which is, you know, I'm not really addressing the politicians here, but, you know, the historians. You, you need to, um, you know, you can revise your current attitudes, but you shouldn't be revising the past. And the Soviets were masters at this. This particular uh, series of photographs was highlighted in a, in a great book some years ago called The Commissar Vanishes. So the first picture you have with the four people um, is the uh, four uh, ruling people in Stalin when Stalin was, was early on. All four of these people were the important leaders in the government, and I think one of them is Trotsky. I'm not sure who all they are. But in any event, you know how we have pres pictures of the president, you know, in the post offices and government buildings. Well, in the Soviet Union, they would have this picture everywhere in every official building. Well, you know, at some point, Trotsky, well, pretty early on, Trotsky was out. He's a guy on the left. And, um, we didn't want to talk about him, so they just reframed the picture as if he didn't exist. Well, then, as time went on, they're, they're retouching, and of course, they didn't have Photoshop then, but they were masters of photo manipulation. After a few years, the guy on the right side, he was out. You know, he was purged, um, probably, you know, sent to Siberia or, you know, executed. And so then we're down to these you know, two guys who are running the government. 
And then, of course, finally, uh, we just have the picture of Stalin. So every time that they would pretend that somebody didn't exist, they wouldn't take a new picture. No, they just take this old picture of this historical event and just keep erasing people out of it so that, you know, many people grew up with just the picture of Stalin and never knew that these other people were important in the formation of their government. So, uh, you know, they were erased from the posters, they were erased from the buildings, they were erased from the textbook. And it's very difficult in totalitarian governments to even study history, because even when we have revisionist history, we still have all of the books, all of the records. You can still go to the library and compare a book written in 1945 to a book written today. You know, in the same way I use the Sands of Iwo Jima and Letters from Iwo Jima, you can go back and you can watch Sands of Iwo Jima, but in totalitarian nations, they actually erase the history. They burn the books. They get rid of the evidence so that uh, people don't have any opportunity, opportunity to go back and compare. And, of course, political propaganda is very popular, no matter what side you are on, to either be called Hitler or the devil. Uh, equating your rival with Hitler or the devil is meant to play on fear and emotion, not reason. I don't think anyone actually thinks that you know, either Bush or Obama was actually a Nazi. But in the past election, we slid further and further into fake news, which is not intended to be political commentary like, I think this person is like Hitler. Uh, it's intended to manipulate and pass as fact, not opinion. So we don't even know what isn't true. Uh, we, we can't tell the difference between what's a legitimate news story and what is you know, political propaganda. propaganda. And if we can't tell the difference, how will future historians be able to tell the difference? You know, the you know we're always stressing primary sources. You know, going back and looking at the newspapers, looking at what was written, uh, looking at you know films from the period of time you're studying. But if what is being made in that period is fake, is false, is filled with misinformation, how will people a hundred or two hundred or three hundred years come back and be able to tell the difference? between what was true and what was just completely made up. So that is everything I know about history and popular culture. Uh, for the next couple weeks, uh, we'll be having some group discussions. You need to be finishing up all of your papers, and you need to be ready to talk about what you've learned, what you know, your uh, changing opinions, and we're going to have a lot of group discussion about the projects you've already done. So you need to be prepared to talk about that. Have a wonderful holiday, and we will see you next week.